Welcome to our afternoon session on face-to-face -face versus virtual delivery. Let's talk about this issue of on-site versus virtual. And uh, what, a year, year and a half ago, when the pandemic was unfolding, we started to look at what we called industry scenarios. And that is you, you start to try to project you know, how things could unfold over time, what's going to be the impact on our industry. And there were two scenarios that we started to talk about very early, very virtual organizations and more digital delivery. And when it comes to very virtual organizations, the question was, okay, we all have to work at home right now. Is that going to continue or are we going to come back into the office and be more centralized like we were before? And it's interesting, very early in the pandemic, we were doing these rapid research polls and two months into it, it was clear that technology companies were seeing two things. Number one, employees were very productive uh, working remotely. And number two, and again, this is two months into this, tech companies were already signaling that they plan to be more uh, remote, have more employees wor you know, working virtually uh, than they, they were going to have uh, previously. And we were asking early on, you know, what percentage of people are going to come back into the office? And you can see that the numbers, you know, are, are, there's a big spectrum here. But, you know, early, 28% of the companies were saying, hey, we think more than 50% of our employees are going to remain uh, virtual in the long term. And what's unfolded since then, um, I just did a, a podcast on this with, with Jim from Salesforce about how they're navigating the hybrid workforce. And it's clear, because we're all doing the survey work, right, with our employees, there are, there are a chunk of employees that are saying, look, I, I really like to work remotely. I like the flexibility. I want to stay like this. Uh, there is another chunk of employees that want the social interaction. They want to come back. And there's a big chunk in the middle that could kind of go either way. So we're all trying to, to navigate what do we think you know, the posture is going to be long term. So let's do our first polling question here and see where the audience is. Compared to April 2020, what posture is your company pursuing? More remote employees, the same mix you had uh, before, or less remote employees? Let's see where, where people come in on this one. Oh, wow, they got that pulled up pretty quick. That was fast. Yeah. And we'll give it a chance for the numbers to, uh, to, to ramp here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is, uh, again, a very hot topic, remains a hot topic. I think everybody's trying to figure out how do we have people remote, yet remain, you know, keep the culture, mm -hmm. all that kind of fun stuff. But as the numbers ramp, there's a clear signal here already, right? So it's somewhere between a 70-20 a rule that 70, over 70% 70 of you are saying, yeah, we are going to have more remote employees. Companies are not coming into the office. So that's how that scenario is playing out. Um, if we go to the, to the next uh, industry scenario, if we cut back to the slides, it's this question of our delivery posture now, right? So if people aren't in an office and, and people are more remote and they may be very distributed throughout the country or through the world, how are we going to deliver our, our, our services? Are we going to basically deliver more remotely or are we going to still have people, you know, going on site, which means uh, when you think about, you know, coverage models, you have to have people local, where's this one going to go? And again, very early in, in the pandemic, we had 96% of, of companies telling us that we plan to deliver more of our services remotely. And I think, Maria, you were doing some survey work on this around education services, and you were seeing the same thing in that data. Yeah, so we did a rapid research response poll in September, so just in the past month, and it was looking at pre-pandemic, so 2019 as compared to current state. And so we asked, you know, based on what's happening currently, do you foresee, uh, you know, Im implementing strategies in the future to continue to drive folks to digital learning? And you can see 95% said yes, and, uh, you know, a minority 5% said no. And then the follow-on question to that was, what strategies are you going to use? And you can see the, the two front runners there. Um, one was to um, include both online learning and virtual instructor-led in a subscription offer, and then the second one being just marketing campaigns to build awareness around all the great virtual uh, offers that are now available. And then you can see the remaining uh, choices there in terms of strategies, but it's very clear people are investing time and effort yep. into digital. Yep, strong signal. So yeah. second polling question for our audience. Does your company intend to keep delivering some of services remotely that were previously delivered on site? So now that you've proven you can do this, if you can start to travel more, you're going to go back to going on site. 
where, where are we on this one? Let's see, since we already got the answer on remote employees. Wow, this is a pretty strong signal as, as well. So a majority of you are gonna have more remote employees. It looks like even a stronger <laughs> group of you, 90%-ish, are going to want to deliver more services remotely. Yeah. Right, so that's how these industry scenarios are, are playing out. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but this is not frictionless. If we go back to the slides, there are, there, and this is what we really want to, to talk about here this afternoon, there are benefits and challenges <laughs> to going to this, to this motion. And if we think of some of the benefits, I mean, the, the, in, again, this is the low-hanging fruit here, the fact that you're saving travel, it's, it's easier to schedule these things, it increases the availability of, of, of scarce delivery resources. These are all things um, that are, 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 again, the, the, the low-hanging fruit of going to this model. Um, but there are challenges, and challenges around uh, you know, the customer preferences, they want you know, people on site, you, you have to re-engineer how you're delivering these services, <coughs> you're doing this remotely. So we know that, again, this is not frictionless. So, so one more poll to warm us up. How do you personally feel about the delivering more services remotely? I mean, do you think there's more benefits than challenges, more challenges than benefits, or you're on the fence? This is probably the most important poll to kind of get the pulse of the room here and kind of see, see where folks are. And here comes the data. Looks like the jury's still out for quite a few. Yeah. I haven't decided. 20%. Yeah. So I'm curious as the data's coming in, if we look at the different service activities. So Maria, for you on education, <coughs> How does this align with what you're hearing from your members? Are they thinking they're going to do more of this or? Yeah, so I think education's a little bit different because we were delivering virtual instructor-led training 10 years ago, at least most of my members, not everyone. Um, those who were not were very quick to act. Like within six months, if they had been doing all instructor-led, they had something at least available on demand, moving to also being able to provide virtual. Yeah. So um, the, the key thing is, and based on a webinar poll that I did just a couple weeks ago, is that if they had digital capability, they're investing more. And so it's very clear that... Um, so, so they were on this path before and this has accelerated it? Yes. Let's yeah. contrast that with what you're hearing in professional services and in, in, in terms of that data. It's, yeah, it's a similar kind of story, Thomas, and I'm, I'm not sure um, what kind of perspectives we have here in the audience, but any PS person in the audience knows that we've been doing virtual delivery forever, ever since there's been an internet, but not for all things that we do. So there are some things that you would tend to do almost exclusively in person, your initial design sprints, maybe your big project kickoffs. So all of a sudden, in March of 2020, you can't do those things on site. So whether the benefits are greater than the challenges or vice versa, you didn't have any choice. You had to very quickly build the muscle to go and do those things that you have done exclusively on site. Now you're exclusively doing them virtually and, and we're, we're in the same boat with our own advisory services. You know, everybody here on the stage does quite a bit of advisory. And I tell you that prior to March 2020 or so, it was about 100% in person. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, in March of 2020, it was 0% <laughs> yep, in yep. person. And I think there's a lot of perspectives in the audience that we went through the same sort of thing. So it's really more about those things that, it's not that you don't have the ability to deliver virtually. We've had that ability for a long time. It's those things that you really want to deliver on site, like a strategic workshop or something like that. You can't do it anymore. So you've got to overcome those challenges, whatever they are. So, so let me build on that and this question to the panel around, you know, what specific activities are you seeing being moved to remote? You just put an interesting one on the, on the table, Bo, in terms of, you know, if let's say you're doing, you know, education or alignment, you know, strategy types of, of workshops that, um, that you, you know, always did those on site, that face to face, had to do them remote. Now that travel starts to open up again, do you see some of that still saying remote? some of those motions, even though you could have the ability to go back on site? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, you're seeing that. No, yep. no question about it. And, and it's because of all of the, the, the benefits 
mm -hmm. of doing it that way. And then, but every benefit has a challenge associated with it, and I think we'll get to that. Yep, we will. And then, and I'm curious, you know, Val, from the support to field services, are there any activities you think, you know, had to go remote in the short term and will stay more remote in the long term? Any specific? It's, it's kind of interesting because in support, by definition, it's remote service, right? And field, by definition, is on site. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what's happened, uh, you know, during the pandemic, uh, it became more difficult to go on site. And in some, some cases, you know, you were concerned with safety, uh, security, access, and, uh, you know, to try to make, you know, to make it as effective as possible if you had to go in. So even with all those challenges, what, what started to happen was technology came in. People started finding remote video, right? We've got a couple uh, com partners in the, uh, in the expo, like Help Lightning and Care AR, you know, that allow you to begin to triage either in support or in field before you dispatch. Hey, let's see if we really have to go on site. Right. And so now when, when that technology is there, it's making the entire process that, that much more effective. So you'll always have to go on site, but, but what do you do when you're there? You know, can you, can you be efficient? Can you start to do other things like drive expansion, you know, drive some cross-sell, upsell? Yep. So, you know, in this, you know, there are a whole, you know, set of, of new capabilities required here. This is what we want to talk about, right? In, in terms of technologies, in terms of your methodologies, in terms of, you know, metrics, um, et cetera. And, you know, one of them is the fact that the, this really does require different skills for your service folks. Like, you know, Bo, you know, if, again, if you're doing a, a workshop that you used to do face-to-face -face and now you're doing it remotely. So for folks in the audience, I mean, what you basically said right now is, hey, we're going to have, A, more remote employees, and those remote employees are going to be delivering more services virtually, not going on site. If those two things are true, then are, are you right now training employees to effectively deliver services remotely? Is this, is this an investment um, that your, your company is making? Yes, no, and I don't know. You know, I had to add that option after, after <laughs> I realized after a couple of years, you have to add that option because some folks are like, I, I, I yes, don't know. I, no, I'm not really sure. The, um, mm. Now, this is fascinating. No, Let, is. Let's have to run the numbers run up here a little bit. Yeah. Um, right now, right, mm. it's a, uh, well, close to, it is a majority practice. Mm. Over 50% of the folks saying, no, we are not doing any particular training. On, on helping employees learn to do this, mm. this delivery um, differently. And it looks like that number is going to hold pretty close to that. So let's go back to the slides and, and go back to the panel on this. So, you know, mm. what are, do you see members doing to improve the skills of employees to effectively deliver remotely since it is a different motion? So uh, there's, in managed services, I'm just listening to the conversation that the team is having. And I, and I remember when we started benchmarking years ago, there was a pretty substantial portion of managed services revenue that was still coming from on-site delivery, custom outsourcing on-site. And, uh, and I think back then it was about 29% of revenue. Uh, and then it slowly trickled down to about 19% of revenue. And we were doing a benchmark review for a member back in January 2020. And, and I was looking at their mix of on-site revenue to remote, and I said, hey, you're, you're way out of line with your peers in the industry, and you've got to move towards more remote managed services. The, the revenue growth rates are higher, the profitability is higher, the retention rates higher. And they said, no, no, you just don't understand you know, our business. We have to be on-site. And that was January 2020. And then three months later, they called and said, OMG, my customer just said I'm not allowed on site. So the customer had mandated it being on site. I've got to get everything moved to remote as fast as possible. And they had no idea how to deliver those services. I and mean, so number one was they had to reteach all of those on-prem engineers how to do remote delivery. Uh, the second area was as they're moving towards remote delivery, a lot of professional services for these companies had stalled. And so there was uh, all of these extra resources that couldn't be deployed on site and all these managed services organizations which were short in resources because it was a great accelerator towards these managed services offers. You know, get out of my location and <coughs> deliver these services remotely. And, and so we've actually seen a lot of training, a uh, cross-pollinization of training from professional services resources to come into managed services and, and learn how to deliver the complete suite 
suite of services. And then the third area I'd probably say is managed services have become incredibly software centric. And so there's a lot of training and education for resources on how to move away from manual types of intervention and human resource intensive operations to software oriented delivery. And that is an entirely different skill set as well. Uh, so a lot of uh, development in those three areas. Yeah, we're, and we're going to talk about tools and technologies uh, next, but I think there's, you know, you have to train people. Uh, like you're saying, there's going to be more software intensive experience. You know, for us, I mean, we all had this personal experience and this skill that we had to build as a team, but anybody out there that was delivering knowledge transfer type of services, mm -hmm. right, where you're, you're, you have an engagement where you're, you're trying to educate the audience, et cetera, you know, Pre-pandemic, you would do that type of, of effort on site. You would have an audience for two, four, six hours. You could stand and deliver content. You could read the body language. That goes virtual. We all, and again, I'm sure any of you doing this, had to learn a different skill set there. You had to learn that I, you, know, you can't just core dump for two hours. You got to chunk it. You've got to build in interaction you, because otherwise people are checking out when they're getting that type of service delivered remotely. And I know we all <laughs> went through yeah. that. <laughs> that was uh, fun. Yeah. Given you know instructor-led training, being in a classroom, to your point about you know one of those the, the, the advantages of that is being able to read body language and know are people with me, are they not with me? Should I slow down? Should I speed up? All of the body language cues that you get when you're face to face with someone, and there was a lot of rethinking. So you can't take a three-day class and just transport that into a virtual delivery because sitting in front of a Zoom session for eight hours a day for three days isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of repackaging that goes on, looking at, like you said, Thomas, ways to engage people, um, you know, ways to also try to get a read on the audience, those kinds of things. And, and I also had members who, who did spend time, even though it was instructor-led, that the classroom delivery is different from the virtual, and they put together a whole... I think it was like a one day training session they did with their instructors for how they needed to change their skill set to be effective in the virtual delivery. And Bo, are you seeing for the PS organizations, are, do you see folks saying, hey, we've got to retool you and teach you some new skills on how to do this mm -hmm. remotely? Not enough. <laughs> I mean, not enough. I mean, one thing we know for sure, another way to say all of this that we're saying is that if you simply carry your legacy methodologies and offers forward and your ways of delivering, then it's not going to work in, in the new context. Uh, I can tell you what we've done. We've done no less than completely re-engineer our entire offer portfolio for, for virtual first. We've trained up our PM team to be able to use uh, tools and technologies that we're going to be talking about. We've asked our, our researchers, meaning our consultants, to completely rethink the way they do their workshopping using completely different uh, methods and different ways of engaging people. And so we've had to completely change the way that we deliver. But again, that's because what we did before was completely, totally, 100% in person, in a room, right, captive audience. And now you have very different challenges, but a lot more opportunity as well. Yeah. And I think we're going to talk about that, some of the advantages to doing this. Yeah virtually is that you can have whatever number of people you want in the room. Yeah. Yeah, but that presents challenges with yes. engagement and, and keeping on time and keeping on track. All kinds of sort of uh, valleys and troughs to have to navigate. But if you just do everything the way you used to do it, you're going to run into big problems. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, and I think, so the first key finding here for the audience, right, so a majority of you are all saying we're definitely going to be doing more virtual delivery, but also a majority of you said we were not doing any type of formal skills training for our, our delivery folks and that, that, that's a miss. Because that's a disconnect. That, that's a disconnect because they're going to need that help if you want them to be as effective as possible. So now let's move to the technology side of it. Has your company invested in new technologies to effectively deliver services remotely? Yes, no, and I don't know. <laughs> I, someone told me to show up for this keynote, and I have nothing to do with remote delivery, <laughs> so I'm just an I don't know kind of yeah, respondent. <clears throat> Look, you scared them. Yeah, no, you, I don't know. No, no, <laughs> yeah, they're like, I know. I'm never. I know. Gonna, I, don't. I am not saying. I, I should don't be know. in this room. I know. So this is different, and this I, I think it doesn't surprise us as much because we've seen this across you know, different companies. So more of you are leaning into the technology investment. Why? Because we're tech companies. <laughs> That's where we like to spend money. Um, so we have about 60% of 
folks, and that's stabilizing, you know, right there. So, so let, let's get back to the slides and talk about, you know, technology as it comes to, to remote delivery. And, you know, Val, uh, you, you and I were talking the other day about this, and I'm just intellectually curious, sort of the state of this. I remember talking to one of our um, healthcare tech providers, you know, about a year ago. And, and um, it might have been the, the board meeting for the May conference, the advisory board meeting, I can't remember. But we were asking about the fact that if you, you, know, you can't get to, into the hospital, you can't get into some of these areas, what are you doing? And they were in, investing more in you know, the VR type of technology where they would give the customer like an iPad to hold up to the piece mm -hmm. of equipment. And so they could say, okay, I need you know, you know, replace this or you know, punch this, whatever. And I'm just curious, is that something you think is, is gonna be sticky? What else are you seeing in terms of technologies? Yeah, for, for sure it's, it's, it's sticky. I mean, because if you, if you look at the entire service delivery motion, you know, it's 30% uh, of all uh, issues require some type of spare part. And, you know, traditionally it's, let, let's send the good one, send us the bad one back, and the tech hopefully will meet you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Kevin Bowers, uh, you know, in, in field service, he just tested Dell's AR uh, program out, right? Where he had to change a hard drive. Mm -hmm. they, they did this advanced exchange program where they shipped him the part. They uh, were able to, you know, show him, gave him an ESD strap, everything, and said, take these screws out in order, you know, how to do it, how to replace it, how to put the uh, package back in and ship the bad one back. And uh, so when, when, you, when you think about that, you're, you're turning, you know, uh, th this whole process on its, you know, on its head. And it's, there, there's no way it's not going to continue. I mean, right. it's it doesn't go back. Once, once you get that advantage, no it's, way. Not, it's not yeah. going to go back. And, and the George, how about managed services? I mean, what technology acceleration did you see there to be able to support? Yeah, so I, I wrote a paper last summer, it was called The Rise of AI Ops, uh, because we started to see this trickling of investment in next generation technologies. And, and so many companies say, yeah, we're, we're dabbling in AI, AI ops or we're doing it, and a lot of them don't understand that the original definition of AI ops was algorithmic IT operations. In other words, taking data and turning what you've learned out of data into software to drive things in, in a more software driven format. And so, so companies have started experimenting in that. And I was thinking about this when I looked at JB's slides, where he talked about services. And in Q2 2021, services were 64% of revenue in the technology industry. Uh, and, and then we know that there's this rise of AI ops in these next generation automation capabilities and machine learning, yet 74% of companies have no formal R&D budget for service technology, no formal R&D budget. Would your product organization have no formal budget for R&D for product? And so this is, this is a real big challenge. There's this massive acceleration of software-oriented architects or software-eating delivery operations, um, but companies aren't seriously investing in it. And for that 26% that do have a formal budget, uh, less than half of them have a formal budget for things like AI ops. So while we're seeing this massive software evolution, I would say it's not uh, accelerating fast enough. But every single element, building these software-driven architectures, platforms, data analytics, having data scientists involved in your delivery operations, and, and looking at, at obsessively looking and at for and destroying any kind of complexity is, is really the key. So you two down there are talking about this, the really kind of futuristic cool stuff. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about a technology that I think was like rocked the world for, for the consulting and, and education when you're working with people virtually. Was it, was it Microsoft Excel? No. <laughs> no, no. And it wasn't Zoom. It wasn't Zoom. But it, was, it was a feature Zoom. I think the number notes. one you know, tech, technical feature that I leveraged the heck out of for virtual was polling. Yeah. <laughs> polling. To keep people keep engaged page. when you were, you know, again, working on you know, education, getting feedback. And, and I think, but what you've learned in some of these alignment, you know, type of sessions, the ability for people to provide an intellectually honest response through a mm -hmm. poll. As, so we'll give you a simple example. Hey, is your company, is your PS strategy aligned? And the PS executive is sitting there and you look at your employees. And you th who thinks it's aligned? And all the hands go up. Oh, yeah, we're aligned. We're aligned. You do that on a poll. Virtually, it comes in like 40% <laughs> aligned, right? It's a game changer on getting feedback. So what else? Yeah, well, there's there? no question you get more honest feedback from more people yeah. with the way that we're delivering these things now. But I think about investments that we're making. I think about some much more basic stuff. Mm -hmm. How many people in March or April of 2020 found themselves doing every meeting from their home office 
and with kids in school doing school from your home office. What you needed was bandwidth. Yeah. So you got to invest in bandwidth. You got to invest in things like we did to make your home office more of a sort of a workshopping studio with uh, lighting and cameras and big monitors and, and all kinds of the backdrops and virtual backdrops and actual backdrops. Those are the kinds of things that we found we needed to invest in. And if you're gonna workshop virtually, you gotta make that experience powerful and there are tools and technologies to be able to do that. But there's also some just very basic things that we found that we had to, we had to upscale yep. and upskill ourselves and our home offices. So some of that investment went there. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Anything we're missing on technology or on the... Uh, yeah, first? so for education, it's a little bit different because in the transition from classroom to virtual environment, the first thought is, okay, WebEx or Zoom. But if you're trying to replicate the classroom experience, then what you have to be able to do is virtualize the instances of the software so that you can do virtual remote labs. And, and that was probably the single biggest a stumbling block for for folks in yeah. terms of making that transition because th that is not a small undertaking and it's not without some expense. Yeah. And so being able to build in that remote lab capability was in the transition where, where my folks yeah. spent yeah. most of their, yeah. their money. Interesting. So we like to invest in, in technology and it was definitely required as, as, as we've heard here. Um, next question, we, we, we nibbled on this a little bit, but let's ask the audience here. In terms of re-engineering the delivery process and practices to better support remote delivery, is this something you've done explicitly, yes, no, and, and I don't know? So we talked about skills, but that's different than the actual process. delivery processes, yeah. And the numbers start to roll in. This may be higher than I would have predicted. Sitting over 50, no, going down, down, <laughs> down. We usually stabilize, right? Just a couple more votes. So this is interesting, right? So, so about 50% of you say, yes, we've, we've been, we've been re-engineering these processes. And, and let's play back again. So, so we didn't, we're not investing enough in skills. We're definitely investing in technology, and then you go to the process. So you can see the priorities of technology companies in terms of where they want to spend money to make something better. Actually, the number's uh, going down here, 45%. So I think this re-engineering, if we go back to the slides, of the methodology is also a miss for a lot of companies. Yeah. It's just like the skills. It's different skills, and it's, and it's a different process. And, and again, we've been nibbling on this a, a little bit. Um, but again, you know, Bo, I, I know specifically any, any type of uh, you know, education, knowledge transfer, alignment activities, that process and methodology with an audience has to be way different you know, on, on, the, uh, on, on the PS side. You talked about already for the education side. Anything you two would add you know, for what has to be different in the, in the process if it's going to be remote, the methodology? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll jump in. You know, and if, if you begin to look at the ability to collect uh, telemetry from the equipment on site, you know, about f you got to start thinking about install base that's connected, right? So 50, 54 percent of uh, the install base has some type of embedded diagnostics. Not all of that is, is coming back in, you know, so you can't triage, you can't do that. So what do you do with the rest of the equipment? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've got one member that actually uh, changed the process that said, hey, when you, get a, when you get a dispatch, before you go, pick up the phone, pick up your, your video app, AR tool, call, see if you can diagnose you know, what's going on, and so that if you, it, you know, best case is we eliminate completely, right, the need to, to go on site, go to the next one. Uh, next best scenario is I have my act together. I know exactly what I need. I know what parts. I know what the issue is, and then we can fix it. So, yep. the, the the process, you know, changes completely. And you know, of course, the best thing to do is to get the telemetry, get the connectivity, and and move on. But but in the interim, the process has to has to uh, flow. And then, last but not least, anything in managed services? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so complexity 
equals customization, and customization is a killer. And most of managed services 1.0 was all about customization. And there was a lot of on-site management of infrastructure and applications, uh, but, but complexity kills. And so if there is one thing I would say that anyone involved in managed services or making your journey from traditional technology into cloud has to think of like these three words every day. You have to say simple, standard, scalable. Simple, standard, scalable. Uh, and that's going to be really key to the transformation. That's the 2.0 managed services versus the 1.0. Uh, and so I, I think that's really the biggest difference is moving from on-site into a virtual delivery model is all about scale, scale and efficiency. Yeah, so I mean, what, what I hear is when it comes to changing our methodologies and processes, nobody got a free pass there. None of these service activities, everybody had to do some re-engineering there to yeah. be more effective. And then let's move to this, this metrics, and, and I'm, I'm curious on this one. Has your company implemented any new metrics to assess the effectiveness of remote delivery? The fact that we're doing this remotely, are you looking at different things now? Um, sort of the last part of, of, of really having new capabilities and what we're walking through is, you know, to have a new capability solidly in place, you have to have the skills, you have to have the technology, you have to have the right methodologies, and you have to be looking at the right things, right, the metrics. Um, so let's take a look at the, at the results on, on this one and see where, where people are, are coming in. Uh-huh. So Sometimes one? these things land exactly as you think they're going to. Yeah. This yeah, doesn't yeah. surprise me at all. Yeah. Exactly. The, um, so we'll give them one more minute, but this is a pretty strong signal here that the answer is no. Yeah. A majority of you have not taken a look at, at, at looking at different metrics. And this is not surprising. It's probably the last thing you're going to start to really work on, right, if, is once you get into this more remote posture. So um, as the data trickles in, I'll turn to the panel. Have, have you seen any new metrics that people now care about as opposed to now that they're in a more remote posture? Yeah. Uh, Marie, where are you going to? Yeah, go ahead, George. All right, so, uh, so I just gave you the three S's. There's four P's, too. And the four <laughs> P's are proactive, predictive, prescriptive, and preventative. And that's a big shift in a mindset away from reactive. Things like uptime to percent proactive resolution are some of the key metrics that we're seeing. Uh, efficiency, reduction in the amount of problems coming from incidents. So a way to continue to drive into continual service improvement and all the metrics around that. And Val, you know, I think in, in your world where, you know, time to, to get on site would have been a critical metric, but now I'm not going on site. Is there, what, what do you have moved yeah, to? You know, I mean, if, if you look at the, the old attached service motion, right, it was always, what's my install base under contract? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you have to start to look at what is the, the percent of connected equipment under contract. Interesting, yeah. You know, and it, because it's an easy spreadsheet exercise to say, you know, I can eliminate truck rolls, which is another metric. I can eliminate those, but if, if the equipment's not connected, you know, I, you know, in the beginning we just say, do you have the capability? Now we're saying, what percent? Because if only 5% is connected, how are you going to eliminate 30% of your truck rolls? It just doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is a huge shift in, in terms of a critical success metric, metric right there. What percentage is, is you know, connected? It goes right along with our, when we talk about companies going on, the as a service journey, that first baby step is I have to have visibility for stuff that's on-prem. So that, that's huge. Interesting. Any new metrics that, that uh, you've been seeing, Bo? You know, the reason that the 60% didn't surprise me is that in, in, in my context, at least, it's not... It's not different metrics, it's just that the metrics are different. Uh -huh. So for instance, think about it this way. <laughs> yeah, do explain. If, you're, if yeah. you're delivering virtually and you're, and you're uh, living up to the three S's, right? Simple, scalable, standard. You know, that means that you should be able to flip on that pretty quickly. You should be able to deploy a resource virtually from his or her home office, you know, in principle tomorrow mm -hmm. or next week versus having to orchestrate and organize a massive meeting of stakeholders in an office somewhere. So what this suggests is that customers are always very focused on their time to value. Mm -hmm. So in this world where we're going to extreme remote workforce and totally virtual delivery, customer time to value is faster. 
it better be faster, so you better be measuring yourself differently, just for example, on that one metric. So it's not a new metric, but the metric performance, that's what I meant by that. It sounded no. kind of weird when I said it, but. No, no but that's, that's a PhD expert. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, it is. <laughs> what, what about, I'm, I'm curious as I listened to you, and I was, I was really, I had to focus there. <laughs> I was listening to you. The, the, so it just struck me sort of just time to schedule. I mean, you know, that, that starts to become compressed, hopefully, and is that something people start paying a, paying attention to that we can basically stand up and knock down these engagements faster. Yeah, I mean, in our power hour that we did on Monday, we teed up a bunch of hot topics and the, the topic about customer time to value is number one. Mm -hmm. So this is when you think about digital hesitation or digital fail, uh, the promise of SaaS and cloud is faster customer time to value. So. Professional services organizations all across the planet are much more focused on this now. And one of the reasons that you create these standardized offers with new delivery methodologies and different skills uh, is that your hope is that you can deploy resources more effectively, faster, get your customers to value faster, the, the, the revenue clock starts to tick and you renew them better. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. You, you know, Thomas, to that point, and, and Bo, you know this better than anybody, but it used to take us several months to schedule an advisor engagement with a member. Right. Now it takes several days. Uh, so you have to move at a faster pace, but because of the standardization and simplification, we can move with more agility. Yep. And then have you seen any shift in metrics? Yeah, what I would comment in, uh, Val said connected equipment is, is what you're looking at. For us, it would be connected learners. Mm -hmm. So when you move most everybody to online learning, you, you can have it out there, but if people aren't consuming it, then to, to Bo's point about a faster time to value, well, we know that a trained user helps to accelerate first time to value. Well, when we're leaving the learning up to them, and through online learning, I can go anytime I want. I have to know if people are consuming. So there's much more emphasis on tracking consumption. How long is somebody in the system? With what frequency are they visiting? What do I need to do to prompt them to come back into the uh, learning system, et cetera? So there's much more of a focus on, on the consumption metrics. Yep. So, so we're going to open it up for Q&A in a minute, and I, but I have one more question for the panel here. Um, but again, I just want to emphasize this. I mean, the vast majority of companies in tech want to do more remote, but as we keep poking on the organizational capabilities that you need to truly do this, besides you know, the majority of you investing in technology, we can't forget about these other areas. The fact that methodology is going to change, skills are going to change, and the metrics you're looking at to define success in, these new, in this new posture has got to change as well. So I think you know, that, that's an important point. Think about questions here, but the question to the panel here is they're thinking about their questions is, um, again, let's go back to challenges and, and benefits. Any you know, interesting, let's, let's start with challenges. Any other challenges you're seeing with this that you just want to comment on as people have gone to remote that we haven't, that we haven't hit on yet? Anything you see people struggling with specifically? Culture. Yeah. Culture, belief systems, that's the way we've always done it, that's the way we'll always do it. Uh, so I think it's a real challenge for these organizations to change. Yeah. Uh, one of the sayings that I, uh, makes me think of is, is if you're delivering services the way you delivered services three years ago, you won't be delivering services in three years. So I think that's a big challenge. Well, and I think on the culture one, and I think a lot of the consulting organization is probably true for people that would do on-site, you know, education uh, services is, you know, you, you hired a certain profile and they're like, hey, I, I just can't wait to get back on the plane, <laughs> right? I, I, I got a little bit of that culture with, with my team here, I got to tell you. <laughs> I just, just want to get back on the plane. And uh, I'm missing a lot of miles, now, you know. George, am I speaking the truth here? Um, but you get, that's tough, right? You got to kind of fight that and say, well, hey, that's not actually the best way for us to be, to be doing this anymore. So I, I completely And, and agree. the reverse is true. How do people want to consume? So if you have people who, and, and talk about cultures, you're, you were referring more to internal culture. Mm -hmm. If you look at virtual delivery of classroom training specifically, there are certain cultures who are face-to-face -face cultures. They want to yeah. do that training face-to-face -face and, and working through that mind shift with them is, is challenging. Customer preference. You know, they're going to hold out until they can have it face to face. And Definitely. so I think not only is it doing the working you need to do internally with your employees, you know, getting them 
accustomed to, okay, I'm gonna be here versus on a plane. I think there's a lot of that that also needs to happen in terms of the positioning, the marketing, the value statement around you are going to have the same experience because the tendency is to think, oh, it's virtual, it's not gonna be face-to-face, -face. I'm not gonna be able to you know, touch that instructor and, and people think that that's gonna be an inferior experience. So I know my education folks that have made this transition spend a lot of time on, on, on that positioning. Well, I, I marketing messages. This is a really important one because it's, it's, it's very real on the culture side. And I think yeah. that, you know, if you have cu customer pushback, you know, I, I, I don't want this to be remote, even though we yeah. want to deliver remote, you, you know, two, two obvious levers, right? So one is pricing. You could say it's, it's going to be cheaper if it's, if it's remote, right? Yeah. But before I pull that one, I would focus on the value proposition conversation, yeah. which is actually if we do this remotely, I can unlock a better value proposition for you, and here's how. That's, I think, the winning conversation. Without a doubt. I mean, let's face it. People are habit-driven, yeah. right? And they have uh, expectations, the ways they've always done things. And so it's on us. This is why you go all in investing in an entirely new portfolio of services that are virtual first. This is why you do that. You're going to market with a strong value proposition, and you're going to be able to convince the customers that you can do at least as well in, say, a strategic workshop virtually as you can in site and frankly on site. And frankly, there are some big advantages to doing them, you know, in, in a virtual context. So we've got to knock down those barriers and those walls and change people's hearts and minds by just having a better business case to make for these virtual first offers. And it's been working for us. You save a lot on new shoes if you don't have to travel. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, are there are any other either challenges or benefits that we, did, we didn't um, get Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, chime in. I, I think culture internally, but, you know, like Maria and Bo were hinting at, it's, it's the customer. You know, we know that you have to connect and, you know, to get telemetry and coming back. Customers are saying, I'm not letting you, I'm not letting you connect. And so some of that, what we've seen... You know, you got to convince them that this is a better value proposition. If you let us connect, we know what's going on. We will fix it in one visit. We will get there quickly. We will make all that work. And some successful uh, uh, organizations have actually shifted telemetry from an, from an opt-in to an opt-out, meaning that when I sell you a contract, it comes with connectivity. And if you don't want it, you know, you have to actually check a box. You have to do something, right? So think a nudge. So, so you're trying to push them in that direction. And, um, you know, if they opt out, your price goes up and you get slower response and resolution times. And, and th mm -hmm. then you start to change the, the customer mm -hmm. mentality on uh, that. customer mm -hmm. mentality as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if I play, again, the whole talk track back, right? We all want to do this. We need to make the proper investments to do it. And finally, don't forget to bring your customer along on the journey because just because we want to do it, doesn't mean automatically the customer you know, sees the, the benefits. We've got to you know, be really explicit about those and, like you say, nudge them you know, with good nudges in, in the right direction. And we are pretty much nailed on time here. So thank you very much, panel, for all the insights. How about a round of applause for the, uh, the brilliant TSIA research? <laughs>